damp fog, accompanied by a thick, misty drizzle, hung over the dense forests of the Ardennes early on Saturday, 16 December, 1944. Beneath snow-laden pines, GIs huddled in their foxholes, hopelessly trying to stay warm in the freezing temperatures. The Germans called it Hitler weather. Allied air power was virtually useless. Suddenly, the dark, quiet stillness was rent by the thunder of German artillery rounds crashing through the pines onto the startled, frost-bitten Americans as the Battle of the Bulge began. Following the ear-shattering barrage, German armor and troops poured into and through U.S. lines as the largest land battle on the Western Front began. The GIs and their commanders were taken by surprise, that is, except for Lieutenant General George Patton and his intelligence officer, Colonel Oscar W. Koch. Patton's Third Army was positioned on the right shoulder of what would become the Bulge, preparing to launch an offensive against Hitler's Siegfried Line and on to the Rhine. His G2, Colonel Koch, was collecting disturbing reports about developments on their left flank. General Patton knew the importance of effective, accurate intelligence. Koch later wrote, In Patton's command, intelligence was always viewed as big business and treated accordingly. Koch had been with the general since the invasion of French Morocco in 1942 and knew each other well. General Patton called him the best damn intelligence officer in any United States command. The intelligence organization Koch developed allowed him to partially penetrate the German plan of deception for their counteroffensive in the Ardennes. Koch deserves the credit for recognizing a problem where few others saw anything. Koch noted that the German withdrawal has not been a rout or collapse and that the enemy was just playing for time. Unfortunately, Koch was a lone voice. By 10 November, Koch observed a series of German armor withdrawals from the front line. Koch requested a heavy schedule of photo reconnaissance mission from Patton's 19th Tactical Air Command. Photo interpreters were able to trace the progress of several hundred trains on daily missions, estimating the size of units being transported. On 23 November, prisoner interviews revealed a secret order that all English-speaking personnel should report to Osenbrook for training in reconnaissance, sabotage, and espionage, and that captured American uniforms would be sent to that place. By 9 December, Koch was concerned that the buildup north of the Third Army would impact scheduled operations. According to Koch, Abundant information was at hand to support the deductions we made. History was to prove them correct. By the end of that week, his G2 weekly report indicated, Overall, the initiative still rests with the Allies, but the massive armored forces the enemy had built up in reserve gives him the definite capability of launching a spoiling offensive to disrupt the Allied drive. Patton's Third Army was watching. On 16 December, Koch stated, The enemy is massing his armor in positions for tactical reserve, presumably for a large-scale counteroffensive. Patton instructed his Chief of Staff, Brigadier General Hobart R. Gay, to begin outlining various lines of action to meet the northern threat. Koch indicated, Patton wanted the Third Army to be in a position to meet whatever happened. By the winter of 1944, even Allied intelligence officers were caught up in the buoyant tide of optimism as a result of the rapid advance across France. Much of the intelligence news was happy news. Many intelligence experts believed the German army was on the verge of collapse as it fled east. The last G2 report, written before the attack, came from General Bradley's headquarters and began with a very flashy splash. The enemy has had it. The deteriorating weather did not help the intelligence analyst and the next few days showed just how wrong that report was. As German forces advanced on 16 December, Koch and the Third Army watched intently and concluded, It may well be that this is the enemy's main effort. Time alone would tell as the soupy weather hindered intelligence. By the evening of 18 December, five German armored divisions had been committed and seven new infantry divisions were identified in the assault. German forces far outweighed the Americans in the Ardennes. Eventually, the German penetration would grow to 40 miles deep and 30 miles wide. Army Group Commander General Omar Bradley and Supreme Commander General Dwight D. Eisenhower directed Patton to execute a 90-degree change in direction and attack the German penetration on the flank. 
This was a remarkable movement of tens of thousands of men facing eastward, pivoting north and moving them, along with their armor and supplies, over inadequate and icy roads to counterattack just two days later. Turn he did. Patton's Third Army, thanks to effective intelligence gathering, was prepared to implement the turning movement and advanced to contact to relieve the surrounded screaming eagles of the 101st Airborne Division battling for survival in the Bastogne area. Patton's Three Corps, spearheaded by a Patton favorite, the renowned Fourth Armored Division, deftly pivoted 90 degrees, shifted over 100 miles in the middle of winter, and prepared for an attack a mere 72 hours later. On 26 December, elements of the 4th Armored Division linked up with the defenders of Bastogne and the siege was lifted. Never again would Hitler be able to launch an offensive in the West on such a scale. The war would reach its conclusion just a few months after the elimination of the Bulge. An admiring British Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill, stated, This is undoubtedly the greatest American battle of the war and will, I believe, be regarded as an ever-famous American victory. By informing Patton of the potential threat to his flank, Koch started his commander thinking about how to react to such a situation. As a result, when the Third Army attacked the southern flank of the German forces, they helped break the back of the Germans' counteroffensive and relieved Bastogne. The famous Army World War II history green book, The Ardennes, Battle of the Bulge, concluded Allied intelligence failed to give warning of the Ardennes counteroffensive preparations. The failure was general and cannot be attributed to any person or group of persons. Despite the Green Book conclusions, Colonel Oscar Koch and his military intelligence staff did not fail. After the war, Koch visited with Eisenhower's G2, Major General Sir Kenneth Strong. Strong asked how we missed the bulge. Koch replied, We didn't. <laughs>